Hi, everybody. This is Nick Rebulis. I'm a member of the International Academy of Education. Uh, we co-sponsor with the International Bureau of Education the uh, series of booklets called Educational Practices. These are short research-based summaries of, major, of the research in major areas of educational policy and practice. Um, today, we're, we're welcoming one of the authors of one of the booklets in that series, Lauren Anderson. He wrote a booklet called Task, Teaching, and Learning, Improving the Quality of Education for Economically Disadvantaged Students. He wrote that book with Anna Pesikin. Uh, Lauren, thanks for joining us today. Oh, thank you, Nick. I appreciate it. So let's get started. So one of the things that's kind of a key <clears throat> concept in the book and in the title is the idea of task, and specifically the way you define task as a key educational concept. Can you say a little bit about how you how you define it and why you use that term as opposed to school work or other kinds of phrases that are maybe a little bit more common in our vocabulary? Yes, that's a good that's a that's an excellent question. Um, I became uh, familiarized and interested in tasks and uh, when I was a graduate student at the University of Chicago, we were reading a, a an article called Model of School Learning by John Carroll. And Carroll basically used the concept of learning task. And he said uh, that if, if you want to understand how well students do on a learning task, all you have to know is how much time they need to spend to learn the task and how much time they actually spend to learn the task. And if you take that ratio, then you'll be able to predict fairly well what proportion of the learning tasks or task that they learn. And that's where it really started. So I've been kind of fiddling around with this for uh, 50 years, pretty much. The way, the, the reason I go with task, other than the fact it's historically in my blood, I guess, is that <clears throat> you can talk about um, academic work if you want to. You can talk about learning activities if you want to. But a, a task to me takes activities because it's important for students to get engaged in learning. Um, as, as Ralph Tyler said, uh, learning depends on the engagement of the students, not the teachers. But if you just go with activities or work, you're missing an important point, in my view, and that's the purpose. Mm -hmm. So a task to me is, is activities plus purpose. Mm -hmm. um, and I came up with that combination when I was doing some research uh, in classroom observations. And uh, students would be engaged in an activity and they would say to the teacher, why do we have to learn this? Mm -hmm. Or why do we have to do this? And it was very clear that they were missing the purpose, that they knew the activity, they knew the work they were supposed to do. They just didn't know why. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's interesting. So you're, you're, you're already building into the concept of task then <clears throat> other sort of sub-concepts like motivation that yes. are, again, we talk about motivation obviously a lot, but you're building that in a way into the concept of task itself, because knowing the purpose of the task is part of what you call engagement. Yes, and and it also changes, uh, if, if you know the purpose of the task, uh, you're more likely to have uh, directed activities instead of just random activities. Mm -hmm. And if you, look at the purpose of the task and you understand the purpose of the task relative to what's going on in the classroom, you're more likely to be intrinsically motivated than extrinsically motivated, that you have a reason to learn something because you're accomplishing some goal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's useful. You know, we have another interview in this series with Stella Vosniadu. Obviously, I know you know Stella. Uh, her booklet, uh, Teaching Students to Learn, overlaps with yours in some of the themes. And one of them is this idea that's also built into the idea of task of metacognition. This, this original idea from Carol that you mentioned of the amount of time you think it's gonna to take to conduct a task versus how long it actually takes. It seems to me partly reflects that self-awareness or reflection about how do I learn? What is the pace of my learning? Uh, and setting realistic expect the learners setting realistic expectations themselves in terms of what and how long uh, it will take to learn something. 
Yes, and and when you put the two together, the activities and the purpose, mm -hmm. the first thing you have to figure out then is exactly what you're saying. How much time am I is is needed mm -hmm. for me to accomplish this purpose with with these activities, and and or do I need more activities, or do I need more time on the activities, or different mm -hmm. activities? Mm -hmm. So you're right. It's it's a it's a self reflection kind of a thing that, uh, and and I think what's important about that is sometimes teachers themselves restrict learning because they minimize the amount of time that is available to learn. Mm -hmm. So if you have time available to learn that is less than a student needs to learn, mm -hmm. then learning is not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, th that's interesting. I mean, it, that even has to do with notions like how we structure the school day, where we often yes. fit learning tasks into the available time as opposed to saying, what is the time it takes in order for this learning task to really be successful or for the loop to be closed? Right. And and that's another reason that I, I, I focused on tasks rather than activities or work, that teachers tend to plan on activities and they plan their time around activities. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, it's going to take this much time to read this chapter or this much time to complete this worksheet or whatever, mm -hmm. but the purpose gets lost. Right. And they don't take the purpose in mind when they say, how much time does it take to learn this, given this activity? That's a very different question. Yeah, so this is, now I want us to turn towards the general theme of the book, which is dealing with specifically economically disadvantaged students, which of course overlaps with certain racial groups, ethnic groups, and other categories of learners. <laughs> the, the booklet really starts with uh, an equity, what I'll call an equity orientation. Before we get into the substance of that part, it occurs to me that the way you talk about task also reflects that equity standpoint, because part of the concept is the awareness on the part of the teacher that it takes different students different time to complete right. kinds of tasks. And that a one size fits all not only isn't going to work, but it is actually disadvantaging or further disadvantaging for certain groups of students. Yes, and, and it also raises the issue of the importance of some of these things for that group of students, because uh, some of the students almost intuitively uh, understand. If I have an activity, I, I kind of intuitively understand the purpose. I understand the goal. But with the uh, economically disadvantaged kids, that's not necessarily a good assumption that there's a, a need for explicitness um, and and we, we back to your notion of self-regulation um, it's 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 yes kids that are pretty good at learning and can do the metacognitive kinds of things that's fine but I think the teachers are responsible for making students more strategic and again that's probably more important for the economically disadvantaged student yeah, so thank you for that. So let's let's turn to that topic in, in somewhat greater depth. This is obviously the main purpose of the booklet. Most of the content is interesting because you're doing, I think, two things here. One is reviewing general principles of learning that apply to all students. But right. then you're also talking specifically about principles or corollaries of those principles that are especially important for students from economically dis or in other ways disadvantaged backgrounds. Uh, can you talk both about, we'll start with sort of the general principles and then talk about how they translate or apply specifically or especially to certain kinds of students. Let's talk about the general yeah. principles. Yeah, the, the, well, it, I mean, you have basically sum, summarized the booklet. Okay. That we, I started with exactly that. Here are some uh, principles of uh, good, teaching excellence and learning. Okay, that, that's where I started. And then I asked the question, how do you adapt or, uh, these, or how do you accommodate uh, this group of students? Now, although when I talk about this group of students, you have to re remind, I have to keep reminding myself, that's not a homogeneous group. Right. That not, not all economically disadvantaged kids are the same. Not all this group of kids are the same. It, it's a variety. And so you, you kind of, shoot for things that you think uh, fill the fill in the gaps or uh, provide the kind of uh, instruction that is much more important for the economically disadvantaged kids than it is for the typical middle class kind of a kid. So when you talk about the the uh, 
the, 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 the general principles, uh, I think, are, are pretty straightforward. I mean, it's, you know, that um, when I talk about, the, 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 there's a section in there where I talk about the, what are the good, what are the components of a task? Sure. Okay, so you have, uh, for example, purpose of the task. Hmm. All right, and, and you have th I, I talk about three purposes, learning, practice, and assessment. Now, the, that's the traditional sequence. Teachers will do learning, then they'll do practice, then they'll do assessment. Mm -hmm. You can't do that with the economically disadvantaged kids. You have to change the sequence. Yeah. Learning, assessment, practice. Right. Because if you don't put assessment in between the two, they could be practicing things that are wrong. Mm -hmm. And uh, somebody says practice makes perfect, but it doesn't. Practice makes permanent. Mm -hmm. So whatever, whatever it is that they're practicing, if you don't have the assessment in there to provide the feedback, mm -hmm. then students can go all over the all over the place. And so that's just one example of a, a general principle right. that you have to modify in order to accommodate differences in in, in uh, economically disadvantaged students. Yeah, I think that's a great point. We're not going to get through that. We're not going to go through all the topics and things. No, no. Good. But I want to pick a couple more just to sort of give a flavor of your analysis. So one of the principles that, again, is a general principle. Uh, we'll talk about the general principle, then the, the particular application is this idea of authenticity and relevance to learning. Right. So let's talk about right. the general principle and then let's talk about how that might translate or apply specifically to this group of students. Okay. Uh, I argue basically that uh, there are three characteristics of tasks, authenticity, relevance, and meaningfulness. Mm -hmm. And each one uh, plays a part in students' engagement in the task. Mm -hmm. Authentic means it has some application outside of the classroom, outside of school. Mm -hmm. It's a real life type of application. Mm -hmm. Relevance means it's consistent with students' needs and interests. Aha! That's where you have the need for making accommodations again. The third one is meaningful. Uh, that is to say the task makes sense. Okay, uh, again, because of a lot of research I've done in observations, uh, you, you, you know, that you listen to kids talk and so forth and so on, and, and they'll say things like, I don't get it. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't get it doesn't mean they, they don't remember it. Mm -hmm. I, under, I don't get it means they don't understand it. It, it makes no sense to them. Mm -hmm. Relevant, relevant uh, authenticity, I should say, is something that applies generally. Uh, all of these apply generally, but the way, the, the, what they, for example, with meaningfulness, let's take that one. The, the typical way of teaching is to give examples that the teacher comes up with, that conjures up examples. Not all these examples are meaningful to uh, an economically disadvantaged kid. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I recommend that what I call inside out teaching. Mm -hmm. You solicit the examples from the students because that's making sure that there's some, some sense being made. And then you mm -hmm. connect that to what you're teaching. So you still have examples and you still have outcomes. But where the examples come from is an important aspect of meaningfulness. So if you start with uh, the, the textbook kind of examples, that's not necessarily sure you're going to uh, connect those with the students, particularly economically disadvantaged. If you start with examples the students can come up with, you're more likely mm -hmm. to make sure that the tasks are meaningful to the students. Yeah, I think that's great. And you bring up something that I, I love, which is true of this booklet and, and all the booklets in this campus. These aren't just sort of reviews of research or reviews of learning. In your booklet, there's always a section of each chapter that talks about the implications of the research for, being, for teaching and teaching strategies. So it, right. it isn't just a theoretical book. It isn't just about learning. It's also about implications for teachers. And you've given some really nice examples of how a general principle of learning can also provide teachers with guidelines or strategies for effective teaching. And I think that connection runs throughout the, throughout your booklet. Yeah, well, that certainly is the intention that that uh, it's 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 an attempt to um, bring bring uh, the, you know people talk about a theory a theory and practice theory and practice theory and practice. My view of it is you need a theory of practice. Mm -hmm. 
you need a theory that enables you to practice in a way that's consistent with the research or consistent with the, what we know about certain things. And so, yes, that's exactly what I try to do. Yeah, no, I think, I think that it, it's, it's an excellent point. Okay, so you've already started this. So we have this general notion of, of, of authenticity, meaningfulness, and relevance as sort of general principles. How do those principles specifically apply to the case of disadvantaged students, economically or in other ways disadvantaged students, and even why these things might be even more salient for certain groups, or as you say, it's a, it's a heterogeneous population, right. subgroups within that category of, of, of economically disadvantaged students. Right. Well, I, 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 uh, the example I gave on meaningfulness right. is, one, is one way of showing right. how this has to be adapted to the kids. That right. uh, textbook examples might be fine for a certain group of kids, but it's not for everybody. Uh, relevance, the notion that it has to be consistent with students' needs and interests. Mm -hmm. This this goes all the way back to Dewey. Mm -hmm. I mean, Dewey, that's what Dewey basically was arguing, that, uh, that you need to know the students. You need to know what they, they're interested in. You know, you know, you need to know what they need to know, mm -hmm. not just what they want to learn, but what they actually need to learn to move forward, to, to, because education is cumulative. And if you fail at an early age, the chances of you failing consistently are pretty good. So you have to sit down and say, so what are the interests of, uh, of students that come out of um, uh, uh, an impoverished urban area? What are they interested in? Uh, what, what do they need to know? Uh, how do you make sure that what we're teaching in the class meets what they're interested in? Okay. Right. Well, to me, the, the, the easiest way to do that is to give some modified choice of, of, of tasks or the activities with respect to the task, at least. And you sit down and say, okay, you, got, you, know, you can't be an unlimited choice. Okay, that gets all. Of, but if, if you say, well, we can learn this or this or this. Okay. And I, I'll give you an example of some of the research I was doing way back when that the, uh, there was a high school class in an inner city. Uh, well, as as inner cities go in South Carolina, they're not quite the same as they are in Chicago and New York and so forth. And the teacher was teaching uh, uh, Macbeth. And so she merged. Uh, uh, there were th three different uh, movies or videos of, of Macbeth. And then there was the reading, which she was really focusing on. So she played each one. She played the witches scene of each of the three videos. And she said to the students, which one do you think you would like to follow as we go through the text? And then once they chose it, you, you kind of say, well, now they, they, they're vested a little bit in it because they've made the choice. And then, they, then she, from there on out, she alternated video, reading, or, or I guess it was the other way around, reading, video, reading, video, or sometimes both ways, okay? And she was able to produce very, very high levels of learning mm -hmm. on the basis of something that uh, some people would even say we shouldn't be teaching that kind of thing to uh, these economically disadvantaged kids, mm -hmm. right? But, but, but the way she was doing it by, by uh, peri periodically uh, enabling them to express their interests or determine things that are consistent with the interest. She role played a lot, Macbeth. It wasn't just reading; it was somebody took uh, so so somebody took Lady Macbeth's point of view, and so forth and so on. All things that are challenging. Okay, and I think that uh, I, I don't talk about challenge, but I do think it's really central to uh, moving students forward. That you know that sometimes we uh, water down things because oh, those students are. Da, da, da. These are the students that really need a challenge. Sure. The the yeah. other the, the more economically advantaged students they challenge themselves, yeah. or they are uh, they get uh, challenged from their parents or from their peers or community or whatever. These kids, if we keep on pushing things down, okay, th they're never going to learn what they need to learn. Back yeah. to needs yeah. to to be successful at the next level. Yeah, I certainly agree with that. I, I'm, a, I'm a strong believer in setting high expectations um, and, and not not uh, condescending to certain students. Um, 
you know, while being realistic about their abilities. Sure. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Let's, let's go through one. We have a little bit of time. Let's go through one more of these principles. We're not going to get through them all. One of the interests me, I think about this a lot in the context of technology, new learning technologies is the, is the old uh, distinction of the sage on the stage and the guide on the side. Um, and one of your principles is guide on the side. And, and what yes. do you mean by that? Uh, again, let's talk about the general learning principle and then talk about why this is especially important for this group of students, this category of sure, students. Sure. The, uh, again, I'm going to rely back on a lot of the research I did in classroom observation. And what I found was that the classrooms basically operate on a, on a, a, a talk work sequence. Mm -hmm. Teachers talk, they assign work, <laughs> students complete the work. Uh, and and the teachers oftentimes, particularly at the elementary school, circulate and provide assistance as necessary. Uh, in high school, typically it's they talk and they talk and they talk, and then the work becomes homework. Do do this after you leave. The problem with that is if if you don't have good attentiveness during the talk portion, the likelihood of knowing enough to do the work is not likely. And so you could have a lot of students that uh, need a lot of help. And the hand, you can see in classrooms, that as soon as they stop talking and give the, the assignment, hands will go up and the teacher will run all over and so forth and so on. Uh, so that's the general principle. Try to figure out that sequence of work and uh, talk and work and how to make it integrated, how to make sure that uh, there's a certain proportion, and and uh, you assess in the middle. We're back to the uh, purpose of test. What's necessary, I believe, for economically disadvantaged students is to change the sequence. It should be work, and then talk. Mm -hmm. uh, let the kids try. Uh, let's see what they can do. Uh, this is very prevalent in uh, the the studies of uh, teaching mathematics in Japan. Mm -hmm where they put a problem on the board and they ask a kid to go up and solve the problem and the other classmates can help them and so forth and so on. The teacher becomes, what I mean by guide on the side is not just sit over there, but the teacher becomes a resource, mm -hmm. okay? Not a directive of the, the class. And so if all of a sudden things start going haywire, as the, the not, not only can't the student do the problem or whatever, can't read whatever they were doing, uh, but he can't get any help from the peers, then the teacher has to intervene. Mm -hmm. But notice that's kind of the, the last step of the process, not the first step of the process. And so again, it's a matter of not, ch not changing the principle, but changing the sequence. It's very, very much the same as I said about the learning practice assessment sequence. Mm -hmm. a, you know, that's fine for a lot of kids, but for the economically disadvantaged kids, it's better to do the learning assessment practice. You say here, here, yes, it's very fine for a lot of people to have the teaching and work, but for the other, for the kids we are working with here, giving them a, giving something to work on and struggle through and work together and cooperate, and then the teacher becomes someone who is a resource, is somebody who can intervene as necessary. Yeah, that's very helpful. It seems it occurs to me also this is a, a also relevant to what people are, are currently calling the idea of flipped classrooms. That yes. it also would apply in that context as well. Right. Lauren, this is fantastic. This is uh, very informative. I want to urge people, we've only touched on part of what's in this really uh, informative and well, well, clearly written and well-researched booklet. Uh, the link is attached to the video. Thank you for making the time to talk with us today. Okay, thanks, Nick.